Uh, okay, so we want to talk about four different uh, classic ciphers. And again, each of these is here for a reason, okay? Um, you know, we'll see these same principles show up later in uh, modern ciphers. Uh, okay, so the first one is sort of the simplest thing you could possibly think of. If you had to design your own cipher system and you never knew anything about cipher, this is probably what you'd come up with, okay? The idea here is that we just want to substitute letters for letters. We just want to disguise the plain text by substituting a different letter for, for a given letter. Okay, and one simple way to do that is to just take the alphabet and shift it over. Okay, and this particular shift shifts the alphabet over three positions. Okay, three positions to the left. So the plain text looks like this. The corresponding cipher text letters are S D I N. Okay, so for example, suppose we want to encrypt this. Uh, super secret message up here. Uh, what do we do? Just look it up, okay? So you just take the letter F, okay, that's plain text, right? What does it translate to in ciphertext? Well, it's an R, so we put it on here. Okay, we go to the O, look for that, that corresponds to an R, put an R, okay, and so on. Okay, so just substitution. Substitute letter for letter, all right? Uh, in this particular case, a shift by three uh, is known as the Caesar cipher, because of course it's named after the salad, right? Caesar's salad. <laughs> okay, no. Uh, it was supposedly used by Julius Caesar in Roman times, and it was actually effective, you know, at that particular time. I guess they didn't have any cryptanalysts around to look at this thing, but it's not particularly strong. Uh, okay, so suppose you know that a Caesar cipher is being used, right? So you're Trudy, you get to know what algorithm they're using, right? You know they're using the Caesar cipher. And you intercept this cipher text. Can you break this message? Yes, sir. Okay, what does it say? <laughs> Smarty pants. <laughs> What's the first letter? S. S. SpongeBob SquarePants. There we, there we go. So okay. So the point here is, uh, you know, if you're really following uh, Kirchhoff's principle precisely, you may tell you it's a Caesar cipher. Big hands over there. Okay, there's nothing to it, right? You just decrypt the message. Okay, but there's nothing magical about a shift by three, right? Why don't we just allow any old shift we want? Okay, if we do that, then how many different keys are possible? Um, actually, there's 26, but one of them's not very good. So yeah, so there would be 26, uh, 26 different keys. And here's an example where the shift is uh, 7, okay? So we can do uh, shifts and make the simple substitution, you know, a little less simple than if it's just a Caesar cipher. Okay, so suppose we're presented with a simple substitution, and we, again, by Kirchhoff's principle, we know they're using the shift button. Okay, so they're doing one of the shifts. Okay, how can we break this cipher? What are you going to do? You got the message. How are you going to break it? Brute force through. Brute force. What does that mean? Try, try, all. try them all. Okay, just try all possible keys. How many keys are you going to have to try before you expect to stumble across the correct one? At most 25. Okay, at worst, you're going to do like 26, okay? I mean, it's possible that you could do the last one you try. But on average, how many would you have to try? 13. 13. On average, you'll get halfway through, and you'll expect to find the correct solution. So remember that. You have to try about half the keys on average. Uh, okay, so suppose you're given this ciphertext. You can play around with this at home. How do we find the key? We try all 26, okay? So, you know, brute force, you know, uh, 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 you know, brute force, try them all sort of thing. We can't just call it brute force, try them all. We have to have a special name for this because this is cryptography after all. So we'll call it an exhaustive key search. Try all possible keys. Now think about it. If you're Trudy, you can always attempt this attack, right? Because you know what algorithm they're using. You know what the possible keys are. Just list them all out. Start trying them. Okay, you can always try this attack. So turn that around. If you're going to build a cipher system, what's the first thing that has to be true of your cipher 
if it has any chance of being useful. Last number of keys. It has to have a large number of keys. So many keys that Trudy cannot possibly try them all. <laughs> okay, so you have to have a large number of keys. All right, rule number one. <laughs> Um, okay, so well, let's stay with this simple substitution thing for a minute here. There's nothing magical about a shift, right? We could actually allow any permutation of the alphabet, and that would be a perfectly fine key, too. Now, what does it mean, a permutation of the alphabet? What is the definition of a permutation? Come on, you all had math 41. Is it the order of the elements? Yeah, it's a reordering, okay? So any reordering. So that just means every letter has to be in here and every letter's in there once. Okay, so it's just a rearrangement of the letters. Any rearrangement of the letters will serve as a key for a simple substitution cipher. How many different rearrangements are there of the 26 letters? A 26 factorial, or as I like to call it, 26. My little math joke there. Okay, so anyway, 26 factorial. Uh, is about 2 to the 88. So, you know, in modern terms, that's like an 88-bit key. That's, you know, a lot of ciphers don't use 88-bit keys today, right? That's a huge number of possible keys. So you cannot try them all. Okay, there's no way you can try all 2 to the 88 keys and have any chance of success. So this cipher's secure, right? Well, okay, trying them all isn't necessarily the end of the story, right? You could be a little bit more clever, right? So that's it. You know, sort of the next step in cryptanalysis, be a little bit clever. So, okay, we're Trudy again. We intercept this message, and we know that it's a simple substitution cipher. But it could be any permutation. It's not necessarily a shift, so we can't try them all. So what are we going to do? Um, you could try looking at the occurrence of letters, right? Okay. If there's certain properties of language you can probably take advantage of. Okay, so like what, suppose it's English text, you know, what sort of property of English would be kind of the most obvious? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so you know, when they play Wheel of Fortune, they have to pay extra for the letter E. There's a reason for that, right? Because E is the most common letter in the English, al English alphabet by a large margin. Okay, so what does that tell you? What could you do here? How could you take it? It will take a while to look for the most common letter. That's right. Okay, so whatever is the most common letter here is almost certainly corresponds to the letter E. Okay. And so on. You can start picking off you know, individual letters. You could be a little more clever and actually look for dictionary words, and there's lots of little tricks you could use to speed it up. But the basic idea is just use some statistical properties of English text to help you solve this. Uh, okay, so you can't try them all. That's just too much work, so we have to actually be clever. And we can rely on, as a first step at least, you know, English letter frequency counts. And look at E. I mean, way up there, 13% of all letters in English are the letter E. So given a reasonable size message like that, it's very likely that the most commonly occurring letter is the letter E. Okay, so we do the frequency counts on this, and what's the letter E? F. F. Yeah, it's going to be F, okay, uh, most likely. Okay, now what? Well, probably the next letter is T. Okay, right. Okay, so you can go back here and you can look and you can say, well, you know, the statistics aren't going to be exactly the same, right? So it could be A, it could be T, it could be O. It's probably one of those high-frequency letters of the next, the next few. They're going to be close, though. So you're going to have a little bit of trial and error trying to figure out exactly which one's which thing. You also have statistics on the occurrence of letter pairs. Yeah, you could actually use that. So, right, so-called digraphs and trigraphs. You could take advantage of that and uh, you know, get much more potent statistics here and uh, speed things up. And I shouldn't tell you this, but there actually are lots of online tools for solving simple substitution ciphers that take advantage of those things and even use dictionaries to speed it up even more. But, of course, you won't do that when you do the homework assignment. <laughs> um, okay, so the, so the start is easy. It gets a little bit more difficult, as you'll find when you do the homework. It, it, you know, it's, in principle, not that hard, but to really do it in practice, it takes some time. It takes some work to get these things to work out. Uh, okay. Okay, so we have kind of a strange uh, definition. Okay, you know, it's my book, I can define things however I want. 
No, actually, this is a very standard uh, definition. We'll say that a cipher is secure if the best known attack is an exhaustive key search. Okay, the best thing you can do is an exhaustive key search. All right. Well, that means the cipher is insecure if there is any shortcut attack. So if there's anything, any shortcut attack. You can always do an exhaustive search, right? That's sort of the, you know, the, the, you know, the thing you can always try. Okay, so if there's any shortcut shorter than an exhaustive key search, then we say the cipher is insecure. Okay, did I say this definition definition's a little strange? Why is this definition a little bit strange? Even if you couldn't do a full brute force or exhaustive key search, you could still get a smaller set that's unsearchable. Uh, that's true. Okay, that is true. So actually, it could be insecure, but you still couldn't break it. Right? Yeah. I guess that's what you're saying. Um, yeah, you could even turn that around. You could have a cipher that's secure, that's easy to break. Think about it. The simple sub suppose we're in this case where it's a simple substitution, but we know it's a shift by n. What's the best attack? What's the best thing you can do? Try them all. I mean, that's going to be faster than any statistical analysis you could possibly do on that. Okay, just try them all. You're going to have it in 13 tries or, or so on average. It doesn't get any easier than that. But that's an exhaustive search. So if that's the best available attack, that cipher is secure by this definition. On the other hand, that thing with the 2 to, 2 to the 88 different possible keys, that's a lot more work to break. But it's certainly a shortcut compared to trying all 2 to the 88. So by this definition, it would be insecure. Okay, so why do we define things this way? Now we've got to have questions put on the test, obviously. We've got to be confusing. No, okay, no, there's actually a reason for doing this. And the reason is this. If someone proposes a cipher, you can always do the exhaustive search, right? So however many possible keys there are, the size of the key space is sort of the advertised level of security. You can't be any more secure than an exhaustive search, right? That's the most you could possibly get. So if there's a shortcut, that means false advertising. It means there's sort of a fundamental flaw in the algorithm itself. And that's what you really hate to see if you're a cryptanalyst. You hate to see some flaw in the algorithm. Because attacks, as Bruce Schneier says, attacks never get worse. They only get better. <laughs> okay, so once somebody finds a shortcut, you're always concerned somebody's going to find a faster shortcut. Okay, so in practice, what this means is, what you really want in practice is a cipher that is secure by this definition, and what else is true? If I just say, what? Okay, so yeah, it's secure, and the size of the key is too large for somebody to do an exhaustive search. You have to have both of those things true, okay? So it has to be secure in this definition, and no exhaustive search is possible. Okay. Uh, okay, so anyway, think about that. 